the, the phenomenon of illusion is quite interesting because it tells you something about how our perceptual work, how, how our perceptual systems work, and what happens if they don't work. And what happens if they don't work is that you get a variety of different uh, um, experiences that we would consider to be illusory, like hallucination, and when you see mirages and dreams and so on. And they seem to project or, or convey a different kind of reality or a different kind of uh, um, uh, type of reality that you experience. And now the question is, of course, is that as real as the um, reality of the waking world? Is it a different kind of reality or is it just something that looks like reality but isn't really, right? So this kind of phenomenon which you can, uh, which you can investigate quite precisely by using empirical means raises these very deep uh, philosophical questions about uh, the nature of the world and the nature of our perceptual relations with the world. So to that extent, illusions are a very interesting way and very, very, I think, very good example of getting into a discussion of these fairly fundamental questions. And so do you have an example of one such illusion which gets to these fundamental questions? Well, I mean, you, you'll start up with, with a very everyday ex experience like dreaming, right? So everybody dreams, most people dream every night, and you are, when you're dreaming, you're transported into a, a world which is very, very different from, the, from your waking world. You s probably still think you are you, so there's some kind of continuity, but it's already very difficult to say, you know, what kind of time you are in you know are you you obviously not usually you don't dream that you are that it's night when you are night right so obviously in a different kind of time you might be in a, in, a, in a space that's completely different from your usual surroundings so you have this experience of being immersed into a completely different world which whilst you are in the dream looks exactly as real as all of this stuff here yeah and now the question is if you are so completely taken in by that in this situation why are you more convinced that when you are in the waking world, as I think I'm right now, why are you more convinced that you are actually really in touch with things that are out there, like a, a really existent space-time, whereas in a dream where it exactly feels the same, but we would think, no, in that case, this is all just something cooked up by your mind or cooked up by your brain. Yeah? So to that extent, that just a, a very, very everyday phenomenon like dreaming gets you into, into those kinds of uh, questions. And this is why philosophical traditions from all around the world have focused on that and thought that was a really interesting theoretical problem. And so you see these as philosophical problems rather than scientific problems which might be able to explain these issues of illusion? Yeah, I think these two, these two issues work together, right? Of course, there is, there is the, the scientific question, you know, what actually happens when we're dreaming, what kind of neurological processes are involved, how do they differ from the kind of neurological processes that are involved in the, in, the, in the waking world and so on. So this is what stuff science can tell us a lot about. Yeah? But what the, the next question that we want to ask then, and that is where the, where the scientific question stops, is what is actually at the other end of the representation? What is being represented, right? And that is something which um, uh, is a question that asks something about what is at the other side of empirical means, and that is not something you can investigate by empirical means because the empirical means only take you so far. Yeah? So to that extent, the, the, the scientific questions um, have to end at, at, a, at a certain point, and at that point you really have to start with theoretical reflections about the scientific results in order to get any further. And so you said that philosophical traditions are all over the world have sort of dealt with these illusions, mm -hmm. or like the phenomena of dreaming, for instance. Mm -hmm. Why has your work focused on philosophically, and how, is, how have they dealt with this? Why so my you've work worked, is there? You've yeah. worked a lot on Buddhist philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's or right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you can draw on to help explain these illusions? Well, the, the pheno I mean, the phenomenon of dreaming became very important in specific parts or branches of Buddhist philosophy, where in general the whole idea that the, the world is in some way illusionary was, uh, became a, a major intellectual focus. And um, different, different Indian thinkers in particular tried different ways of trying to explain that and trying to make sense of what that means. And one way of trying to explain that was, was saying, look, the entire world is mental in substance, right? So when we um, look at things, so I see this tent over there, and uh, uh, there's actually not an, there's not an external object out there, but it's rather what I see is some, some construction or concatenation of mental things, of ideas, or of different moments of consciousness, or something like that, right? 
And so what, what they've been trying to do there was trying to develop a, um, a, a theory of the external world that didn't assume that the fundamental entities or the fundamental constituents of reality are bits of matter, but bits of mind, right? So to that extent, it's, it's quite an interesting way of trying to come up with a theory that is the complete inverse of we normal, what we normally uh, think is the best way of explaining the world, namely, first of all, explaining the material bit and then seeing how mind gives rise to that. What they were trying to do was the, the other way around. They started with the idea of, of consciousness and mind as a primitive, and then they tried to come up with an idea of how the material world could arise from that. And where are your own thoughts on this? Do you think mind comes before matter or matter comes before mind? Ah, well, that's a very good question. I think, um, uh, well, if you, if you answer the question either way, you'll have to assume that there is some level of reality that is fundamental and everything comes from that, right? So you have a kind of foundationalist picture. Now, I think that is probably, um, is probably not a satisfactory way of thinking it in the end because what you end up with is um, a set of entities such that the um, dependence relation go, go, go both ways, right? So material stuff determines mental stuff and de mental stuff determines material stuff. So it goes, it goes both ways around, in which case you'll end up with a position where you have no fundamental theory yeah? or you have no rock bottom uh, ontology um, to explain it all. So you end, end up with this kind of coherentist picture where everything uh, depends on some other things, but there are no completely independent things. Yeah, so I think that is the most, the, the most satisfactory philosophical way of thinking about it. And so do you think that means that we shouldn't trust our senses or perception, or we put too much trust in them currently? Well, it depends on what you want them to do, right? So I'd obviously put a lot of trust in my senses if I you know, want to get from here to the other end of the field because my senses allow me to navigate the, the tents and not to trip over things and so on. So in, to that extent, uh, they, are, they are quite reliable. But the question is whether you would want to say that therefore you can use them in order to settle all questions in particular, whether that you can use them in order to find out what the one true account of reality really is, right? And even whether you should assume that there is such a thing. Yeah? So I think there is a, there is a, um, a difference um, um, insofar as you might want to trust conventional reality at the conventional level, but not at the ultimate level. Yeah. And is this something that you've looked at specifically within humans, or do you think that it crosses all species? Mm, I don't really know. I mean, I, I not, don't have a very, very clear idea about how animal minds work, right? I mean, uh, they, um, they, they have minds that are in many respects very much like ours, but also in other respects very different from ours. And so if you take seriously that, more the idea that a uh, mind might come before matter, mm -hmm. Would you see this as changing how humans relate to one another? If you're putting it within a human mind and an individual, mm -hmm. does this change radically people's relations between each other or like increase the difference between how we think or the origins of reality? Yeah, I mean, this is quite interesting to, to think about what um, uh, what kind of ethical implications these kind these kind of pictures have? Because when you when you're talking about what what is what is at the fundamental le level of reality and what kind of things are fundamental, you're basically talking about metaphysics. You're talking about the kind of furniture of the world. But now the question is, you know, what what does this kind of um, uh, bit of theoretical philosophy? What kind of normative implications does that have? And um, yeah, so for example, you you might think that if you have the idea that the world is the world we live in is fundamentally some sort of collective mental constructions of different perceivers, then um, that immediately raises the question to which extent the mental states of the individual perceivers determine or at least influence the reality they perceive, right? So to that extent, what kind of world we live in becomes a more or less direct consequence of the kind of mental states of the different people they are in the world, right? And so to that extent, you would regard your own mental state and the mental states of others, not, not, not solely or not primarily as representational of what is already there, but as in some form forming or, or producing or bringing about what is, what is there, right? And then the, the ethical implications of that are pretty clear because you think, okay, so if you actually, if your mental state influences as much 
as, uh, as it does on that picture, the reality that is around you, then you'd better take good care of the kind of mental states that you have and that you project because that will be immediate, have immediate consequences for the, the, the world you and other people will perceive. So do you think that there is a objective reality? Hmm. Well, that is the, 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 the typical philosopher's comeback is, you know, that depends on what you mean by objective and it, means, it depends on what you mean by reality, right? So I think there is definitely objective reality insofar as there is a shared world in which we all live, right? So if I, you know, I can see that red bag over there and if you look there, you can see the red bag over there. So uh, to that extent, there, there are some facts such that they appear to all of us and to that extent they are objective, right? However, the term objective reality is also sometimes used in order to describe a reality that is more fundamental or independent of any perceivers, right? So whether or not any minds were around in the world, there would still be specific facts, say, about what kind of fundamental particles they are, right? Or if, so if, if we think that human, humans had never evolved, then the universe, you know, all these, these bits of rock and so on would still be flying around in space. That kind of objective, I think, is a lot more difficult to make sense of and to philosophically justify than the kind of objective in, uh, objectivity that simply flows from a shared, so from shared consensual perceptions of observers. And so where has your work taken you most recently? What research are you doing at the moment? Oh, you've got a book coming out? Um, yeah, I've just... Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, at the moment I'm quite interested in um, the issue of, uh, of solipsism and the, the question to which extent um, the idea that there's only one perceiver, namely presumably only me or only you or uh, or um, only a single mind exists, to which, ex that, to which extent that philosophical position, which was usually regarded as completely crazy, um, how that was um, perceived and, and uh, debated in, in various philosophical traditions. And um, it's quite interesting that, that this idea only came up in various different bits of the history of philosophy. So for example, the problem of solipsism was never a big issue in ancient Greece, right? So the ancient Greek thinkers didn't really, I mean, either didn't think of it or didn't think it was an important problem. Whereas it did become very uh, uh, um, important and quite uh, uh, strongly debated in 8th century India. Uh, and we have a, have a number of, of independent philosophical treatises just devoted to that problem. So at the moment I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, on a both systematic and historical treatment that looks at the question of solipsism and takes it through a sort of global history, so starting in ancient India and then moving, moving through early modern stuff and then the, whole, the question of, of uh, solipsism became interestingly uh, also very, very um, important then in early analytic philosophy, Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, he fam famously made this very enigmatic statement uh, uh, that uh, um, solipsism is, is fundamentally right, even if we don't really know what he meant by that. So it's, it's this kind of a very interesting and often neglected undercurrent within the history of philosophy, and that, that's what I'm looking at at the moment. And do you have an idea of reasons why it appeared in certain philosophies but didn't in others? Ah, that's a very good question. No, I, I, I've, I've no, I don't, for example, have a strong view of why the ancient Greeks didn't ever figure it out, right? It's pretty clear why it, why it uh, first came up in, uh, in um, ancient India because they, 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 that uh, occurred in a, in a debate where people were arguing, okay, so everything is mental, there are no external objects. And then the following question is, of course, yeah, but what about external minds, right? So even if I think that this tent here isn't, isn't really externally there, it's only some bit of mind stuff, so what about... Of, what about your mind, right? Are you an external mind to my mind or are you just a figment of my imagination, right? So that, that leads you directly to the question of solipsism. So that, it's clear how, how that arose there. And then in, in analytic philosophy, uh, people, early analytic philosophy, people also got quite interested in that, but for completely different reasons. And um, for example, one, one place where that became important was in, in early work by early Carnap, he tried to try to construct a theory of the world that was only based on first person experiences, right? So he called that methodological solipsism, meaning that the only kind of primitive input he used for his theory were his own experiences. So and everything else was for that matter disregarded and then uh, both 
external minds and external objects would have to be created or constructed from that. Yeah? So there are various reasons why different, um, different parts of philosophy or different thinkers were interested in those problems, but the, the fundamental problem is of course always the same. And do you agree with Wittgenstein's statement that it's fundamentally right? Uh, well, if I, I mean, if I only knew precisely what Wittgenstein meant by that statement, I would be, it would be much easier for me to say whether whether he's he's fundamentally right about it. I think you, you, what you need is, um, uh, in any case, some kind of account of accounting for the appearances, right? So even if something like solipsism is fundamentally right, we still need some coherent account of why it still appears to us as if they're external minds, right? And uh, so that is, that, that is, of course, the, the, the major question to figure out in this context. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.